should be, I'm glad we're not in Washington. Right? From his home in Walpole, New Hampshire, filmmaker and producer Ken Burns discusses making the Civil War. Here now is media critic and host Ron Powers. Of the people, by the people, for the people. That reading of the Gettysburg Address made me feel as though I was hearing it for the first time. That was our intent. You know, for 125 years, we've labored under the misreadings of stentorian orders who thought Lincoln was enamored of prepositions. Of, of the... By, for. Right. He contained the entire Civil War in that short address. He understood that this was about the survival of popular government, that the aristocracy that would seek to continue slavery, that would seek to continue this... Uh, aristocratic life could not succeed in the struggle, that the bourgeoisie, the middle class as represented by Lincoln and Grant had to survive. So it's of the people, by the people, for the people. This is the only experiment in the world, in democracy, that's going on. Frail, challenged now by its greatest threat, will it survive? He understood the importance of the necessity of that survival. And you understood the importance of a correct reading of the text, one of the continuing great strengths of this series. How much in sync was the actor and reader, Sam Waterston, with your wishes? Sam was phenomenal. He had played Lincoln in a mini-series on television, and I had noticed one thing, that he seemed to understand Lincoln's humor, uh, the, f the human frailty of the voice. I was really impressed with that. And he was familiar with a lot of the speeches. And so when we spoke to him and talked to him about the way Lincoln read it, uh, he knew how to do it. There's probably no more mythic battle in American history than the Battle of Gettysburg. Anybody who knows anything about the Civil War knows about that battle. But also, it's probably the most written about, the most yes. textualized engagement. Now, now, I want to ask you, Ken, what was your specific challenge as a filmmaker to make that battle fresh and meaningful again? First, following Blake, we tried to find the universe in a grain of sand, and we found a magnificent grain of sand in Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain's stand on yes. top of Little Round Top. The academic... A former rhetoric professor from yes. Bowdoen College who tried to enlist Maine, and yes. they wouldn't give him a sabbatical, so he applied for a sabbatical to study in Europe and they did that and he got his regiment. And his only qualifications was that he was a, a gentleman of the highest moral and intellectual uh, worth. Uh, that qualified him to run a regiment. Well, he, as you saw, recalled a textbook maneuver on top of Little Round Top and, and saved that day there. He was one of literally dozens of heroic stories, north and south, that second day. But we chose to focus on that one, and that was important. The next day, Pickett's Charge is the whole big mammoth shebang in which we're, we did focus on the universe there, yes. and that was important to us. We think, of course, of the slaughter of those gallant, doomed men striding across that meadow, those southern men. Um, but New Englanders, paid a heavy price in that battle, didn't they? It's a tremendous story, uh, particularly for New Englanders. Many of the regiments that had even fought the day before bravely and had suffered found themselves moved to the center of the line, the Union line, that seemed somehow safer. And then the, 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 the cannon fire that the Confederates uh, set off, probably the loudest no man-made noise in the North American uh, continent ever, uh, went off, destroying their short rest. Um, one thing we weren't able to get into, a phenomenal story in the middle of Pickett's Charge, is the story of a Vermont regiment. Uh, there was so much smoke and powder obscuring the way of the, of the Confederates coming on that the divisions actually split a bit. And some brilliant Vermonter realized the uh, opportunity this po and came down from his lines into the middle of this confusion and set up his men so that they could fire both ways and, and let off a tremendously deadly fire, this tiny Vermont regiment shooting in both directions. And it's one of the extraordinary great stories of Pickett's charge. There were lots of European generals, lots of correspondents, lots of people who sat and observed this battle, and many of them said afterward, almost against their will, that it was a very beautiful engagement. 
This is the thing we find in war. Men tell us this who come out of war that it is the moment where they felt they lived the most. How paradoxical. Um, most of us have college life <laughs> to think about. But war yeah. is what makes it beautiful. Uh, Robert E. Lee, of course, early on in, in Fredericksburg in this episode said, watching his men triumphantly uh, uh, overcoming the Union advance at Fredericksburg, saying yes. it is well that war is so terrible we should go too fond of it. We know, sadly, that so much of what makes us human is, in fact, um, an enjoyment, an anticipation of war. We quickly tire of it when we're faced with yeah. the reality of it. We found an interesting thing happened. Um, the Battle of Vicksburg is resolved the day after the Gettysburg pickets charge, and yet we could not in our filming go to it right away. Uh, Gettysburg meant that much, so we put in a section called She Ranks Me, yes. which is the story of the role of women in this war, and yes. uh, no other war was a woman's war like the Civil War. The British journalist uh, George Sale, I think his name was, said, this made women changed their whole relationships. Everything feminism before this point had been merely philosophical. Now there were farms to run, businesses to keep up. Women found themselves doing the things they had been told they could not do. Men had traditionally been school teachers. We felt women um, ill-prepared to take this very important job of teaching our children. After the war, there was a lost generation. Women had to assume this new role. They fought. They disguised themselves as soldiers. They served as nurses. This is a great heroic story. And back you go, Ken Burns, with your Homeric mission to hear this, the denouement begin to play itself out in the voices of the people who were affected. I, I remember this very poignant reading of the mother, the Vermont mother's letter to her son to avoid gambling. Yes, that's one of, I think, the, we have a section in, in this evening called Oh Be Joyful about food and eating and, yes. and she has that great please stay away from alcohol and card playing because it will inevitably lead to gambling, I fear, which is a marvelous thing. The humor of the war is very, very important. It's yes. really a delivery vehicle for a good deal of meaning to understand the good humor of these men in the face of all of that. And our good humor, I would hope, in extending their humanness to yes. them in the course of this. And sometimes even the poignant things, uh, the greatest um, uh, gift in a way of this evening was Daisy Turner's yes. eloquent reading of reciting of a poem, The Soldier's Story. We thought she had wanted to sing us a song. Uh, as she had been doing in the course of our interview. And suddenly she came out flawlessly reciting this eight-minute poem as we sat stunned. Of course, our medium is so unfair. You cannot put eight straight minutes. But we thought we had a, a good solution. We divided Daisy up and distributed her, made her the Greek chorus of the Battle of Gettysburg. And what a magnificent counterpoint to this hundreds of thousands of men fighting it out is this single black woman uh, eloquently stating what is the great loss of the war a Vermont. A, hall a hallucinatory reading of Vermont, woman born and bred, daughter of a slave. Daisy lived before she died just across the river from here in Springfield, uh, Vermont, and Grafton, Vermont before that. We recorded her in a nursing home in Springfield just before she died. Um, Daisy is a remarkable figure. We came into her room in the nursing home and set up and filmed her for several hours and she never um, lost a kind of good humor and a sense of what we needed as if uh, she could help us out. The end is coming. By all rights the war should now be over. The South's greatest general has been beaten and badly in Northern Territory. The North has now got a morale-boosting victory uh, the next day as we find out Vicksburg Falls. By all rights, it should be over. But as the subsequent episodes tell, the war descends into this costly, brutal rehearsal for World War I that will yes. come up in the succeeding nights. Uh, trench warfare, the horrible meat-grinding machinery of all-out total war. New men, William Tecumseh Sherman, are going to have their day. Um, 
It's a terrifying part of what's going to go on. 1864 is quite simply horrible. The next two episodes, Valley of the Shadow of Death and Most Hallowed Ground. If the human that contains the, the idea of 63 is Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, the triumph in the middle of all of this, uh, there's really no such hero in that. It's the new war that, that William Tecumseh Sherman is suggesting, the all-out total war against civilian populations that he now realizes has to be waged. It's Nathan Bedford Forrest, a terrifying southern commander, a notch. The volume has been raised even on Stonewall Jackson. It's about the Battle of Spotsylvania, where the fighting is so intense, the bullets are whizzing so ferociously that men's bodies simply fell apart.